Well, Leah, can we go live on YouTube? Looks like she's on it. We can go ahead and get started. Great. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the main meeting of the CID Soto Community Advisory Group. I wanted to thank everyone for joining us this evening. My name is Emily Alice Gerhart, and I'll be your facilitator again tonight. As always, I'm joined by Lita, who's the Government and Community Relations Manager for this project at Sound Transit, along with many other colleagues who um, will be joining um, tonight as well from Sound Transit and agency partners. So for those agency partners who are joining us from the city of Seattle or King County Metro tonight, please go ahead and introduce yourselves in the chat. All right, well, I think we can move on to our next slide to review our agenda for the evening. Great, so we're going to start off with a brief update on the community engagement and collaboration that Sound Transit has conducted for this project. Um, and then we'll go ahead and dive into our main agenda item for tonight, which is to hear from you. And lastly, we'll wrap up with a thank you and let you know where this project will be headed after this. Next slide, please. Okay, so as we introduced at last month's meeting, um, we would like to get your feedback. Um, so we want to hear your thoughts on the draft EIS alternative trade-offs um, and whether the preferred alternative should be confirmed or modified. So we'll spend quite a bit of time this evening um, doing a roundtable hearing from each of you. Next slide, please. Um, so Cahill will next um, start things off with a look at the project's community engagement and collaboration activities. So Cahill, take it away. Thanks, Emily Alice. Um... I'll just go through this slide, which you've seen uh, probably in every community advisor group meeting that we've had and in other forums. It just describes, again, the process that we've been going through over the last number of months um, as we've been going through the draft EIS common period. It notes at the top the draft EIS public meetings, the formal public meetings that we had in March, as well as the community advisory group meetings. You know, as you know, we've been meeting monthly and we're now in May at the last meeting where we're hoping to consolidate the feedback that you would be providing today. And then the next step is to go to our Sound Transit System Expansion Committee. And there's a workshop scheduled for next week, um, May 20th, um, where we'll be driving into the draft EIS with our board members. And all of this is leading towards hopefully a July action by the Sound Transit Board to confirm or modify the preferred alternative uh, that's a little bit different than what you've seen before. We previously had that board action happening in June, in June but we're pushing it out to July to give uh, the board more time to contemplate, digest the comments that were submitted during the draft EIS comment period. Uh, next slide, please. This is just a snapshot of our community engagement uh, over the draft EIS comment period. So the period from January 28th to April 28th, um, starting in the top left here. Um, turns out we have over 5,000 comments on the draft EIS, which is a very good, very good response to a draft EIS. Um, as noted, we've had five formal draft EIS public meetings. We had an online open house, um, which engaged more than our, more than 19,500 visitors. Um, we've had over 60 community briefings, uh, 60 property owner webinars, 12 community advisory group meetings during the common period itself. I know we started meeting before the common period, um, but just during the common period, there were 12 community advisory group meetings. We've had over 30 ads on different radio, digital, and print publications to try and get the word out about the project. I have 38 posts on social media, uh, reaching out to 140,000 folks, over 25 fairs and festivals, eight email updates and platform blog posts, which engaged more than 10,900 subscribers. We've been delivering 1,200 posters along the project corridor, and also in partnership with the Department of Neighborhoods, uh, availing of their community liaisons to help engage uh, businesses along the corridor. So that's a snapshot of the engagement um, that has gone on over the last few months, um, just so you have the latest on that. With that, um, I'll hand it, over to feed, uh, hand it over to Lita to start to uh, engage in the next part of the meeting. Lita. Thank you. Um, thank you everyone um, uh, for all the deep engagement and investment in this process over the last several months. Uh, today's meeting is all about hearing from each of you. We're going to work our way 
um, uh, from the SOTO segment to the CID uh, segment of the project. And each community advisory group member will have time to share your thoughts on issues and trade-offs between the draft EIS alternatives and your thoughts on a preferred alternative. I've dropped those questions just now into the chat. Um, and I am also going ahead and dropping in your uh, names in order um, because I think we'll just go alphabetical. It'll be uh, hopefully uh, easier for everyone to follow. I hope that works and we will go around the virtual room. Um, there's a couple of folks that are not here yet. And so I'll just try to track as we go along who's here. Um, and just to give an early uh, flag for um, Brian, I think based on who's here, you are gonna be going first. Um, all right, with that, uh, let's begin. Um, so yes, again, you're gonna be sharing your thoughts on these couple of questions. Um, your thoughts on issues and trade-offs between the alternatives and your thoughts on the preferred alternative. So we'll begin with the SOTO segment and you can share your thoughts uh, here. Um, Brian, let's begin uh, with you. Oh, am I, am I on right now? You are, you're <clears throat> I can't your see, thoughts. oh, there I am. <laughs> uh, you know, the, uh, we're going to make comments uh, regarding the Soto area. Yes, and then we'll do the CID segment next. Okay. Around well, the you time. know, the, I'm not too familiar with the Soto area because I've been really uh, concentrating on the CID. So sure. the only thing that I would kind of throw in there, uh, <clears throat> if, uh, if there's an alternative to the uh, CID choices, uh, maybe look into possibly... Uh, going into the Soto area as uh, as an area where to, uh, to move the uh, the move the move the the uh, CID station. And other than that, I uh, I hope that uh, that you folks uh, Sound Transit uh, do the best thing for the neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Okay, next we will go to um, Aaron. Thank you. Yeah. So this is my opportunity. Um, yes. <laughs> I think you've all heard me say this before, but it was really challenging for Soto to participate in this process because of the splitting of Soto in half. And with half of the Soto of the, of the line in the West Seattle, and I know Lauren represented us there and half here. Um, it was took us a long time because, you know, there are elements to it that, you know, impact businesses separately. And we finally came together around a consensus of what was the least worst, which is not exactly where we always want to be, but um, we do not have a um, a, you know, a preference on some of the other things, as I'm sure Lauren said, but the one of the things that's most that, that people got around was the station location. Um, and um, as you are fully aware, the Soto station is an underperforming station due to some of its design, the current station, some of its design elements being a, in the middle of a block and it, it has, and so when, what, the Soto would like to uh, suggest is that we move forward with station option 1B. One of the benefits of this is that it is one of the station alternatives that connects to all of the proposed CID stations so that therefore you can you know, think about Soto without thinking about all the other neighborhoods. But the key reasons for this is that it shifts the station down to Lander Street. And with the completion of the Lander Street Bridge overpass in 2020, um, that became the major east-west connector in Soto to our major employment center across, around First Avenue. Between the Home Plate Building and the Starbucks Center, the majority of the people that do take uh, transit into um, Soto are taking it to go there. So all of the other configurations would put people coming out in the middle of a block, and these are Soto blocks, 
um, that are just too long. And so uh, the SOTO BIA and all of SOTO would really like to see uh, station alternative 1B, and I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Erin, uh, for those comments. Um, Mary-Kate, you're next. Hey everyone, thanks for having me while Kathleen is on vacation this week. Um, we do not, Historic South Denton doesn't have a preferred alternative in SOTO, but our primary questions around SOTO's location uh, revolve around two factors. One, how construction and operations will eventually affect, long-term affect the very different traffic patterns that SOTO has as compared to the CID or Pioneer Square, and two, how will this affect Metro? So we've, we've listened very carefully to what the Soto BIA and other Soto neighbors have had to say about this, but also to um, Metro and their concerns about the location. So rather than a preferred alternative, we do have some additional questions, which we did raise in our letters about in particular, those two aspects. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Kate. Um, we'll go to Jared next. Jared, do you have feedback you'd like to share here? Hi, everybody. Um, yes, yeah, sorry, I was on mute. Um, no way. Regarding the Soto, Soto station alternatives, uh, Skip uh, at this time does not have a preferred alignment. Or station options, I should say. Okay, thank you, um, John. Um, yes, I would um, say that uh, I favor one B because it gives the greatest flexibility to um, both going north and south from there. And um, and I, Aaron's comments about people accessing the stations, uh, I agree with also. Thank you, John. Um, Tiernan. No comment on the Soto station. Jeremy. Um, I kind of uh, second what Aaron said about um, the 1B option, uh, being that we are a business that kind of relies on traffic being able to move freely through that area, as well as people being able to use the station, making the station um more usable um is better for us especially our customers thank you jeremy tia Hi, thanks um i'm going to defer to the soto folks for decisions about the uh, soto profile got it thank you jessa uh thank you all i will also defer to our friendly neighbors to the south uh that the Soto BIA for their comments for this for this alternative. Okay, thank you. And Yen? No, no comment, thank you. Okay, great. All right, uh, thank you everyone for your comments on the Soto segment um, and feedback. We're gonna continue on now to um, the CID segment serving the new station serving um, the CID and Pioneer Square neighborhoods um, and the region. So um, again, in this area, what are your thoughts on issues and trade-offs between the draft EAS alternatives? And what are your thoughts on a preferred alternative? And we'll once again, go in the same order. So I hope Brian, you're ready to go here and share your feedback. Uh, so is that me? Yep, that's you, Brian. Go for it. Okay, thank you thank very you. much. Uh, I'm sure you're all aware that uh, that we prefer the Fourth Avenue because uh, there's just too many costs, human costs. If it's on Fifth Avenue, it's a it's a uh, what they call that. Uh, uh, it's, it's a it's an area that should be safe and not disturbed. And uh, there's too many things that are gonna go on in Chinatown that will destroy this, destroy the neighborhood if, if Fifth Avenue is picked. And uh, Fifth Avenue uh, basically will have construction 
in our neighborhood for you know close to eight years, eight, nine, ten years, and uh, businesses down in in the uh, CIB will not be able to withstand the construction terror that goes on for you know for the first three years there there'll be a number of businesses going out of business so you, you, you there's a lot of human costs that's uh, that going to come with a fifth avenue choice and uh and this new uh, you know the the ventilation facility uh that's going to be going on for 100 years and and uh, to bring in good air to the tunnel and to, to bring out bad uh, 400 years, it's, it's just not right for, the, for everyone that lives in the neighborhood. Fourth uh, Avenue has much better op uh, opportunity to not affect the neighborhoods like the one on Fifth Avenue will. Uh, and, and during construction, during construction, you have the the uh, digging of the dirt, you know, every 10 minutes, a dump truck, a hauling truck will be bringing out dirt through the through the community, uh, causing all the noise and all the dust and all the everything, the bad that comes with tunneling dirt out of, out of the ground for every 10 minutes, you know, going on from 7.30 to 10 o'clock at night. It's it's just a bad environment, and all the construction that that happens during those eight years is going to just keep people away from Chinatown, the CID, and it, like I said, it only takes three years to kill a business. So if there is a if there is a, a CID left after construction, uh, you're going to surprise a whole lot of people. And when you have the uh, streetcar uh, coming off Jackson down Seventh Avenue during those eight years, that's that cuts right right in half. So you have total construction going on the whole neighborhood. Uh, our seniors are going to be stuck uh, in their apartments because of all the construction. Uh, and what the good thing about this particular is that you, we have a choice of going to Fourth Avenue, uh, and I would also uh, I would also like to see some more studies on somewhere else, somewhere else besides the the Fourth and Fifth Avenue, some other ideas. Uh, if we can get an outside consultant to kind of look at it from fresh eyes and, and come up with a different way to have. Uh, the the Fifth Avenue station put somewhere else. Fourth Avenue, I, I do understand the cost and I do understand the the uh, the impact it's gonna have on the uh, the bus depot. But uh, again, Fifth Avenue's human costs are just too much. And this is the last Chinatown. Three times, three times Chinatown's been moved from the uh, docks to Second Avenue and to to the area right now, a historic district. And uh, this particular, the CID, is home to, you know, an Asian culture. You have Japantown, Little Saigon, and Chinatown, and all the different cultures that are part that makes up this unique area. So, you know, it's, it's, it's just not right. And the big concern I have is the ventilation facility that's gonna be spewing bad air into the neighborhood for a hundred years. I, there's no answer that uh, Sound Transit can provide me to reassure me that that's not gonna happen because a ventilation system is put in a tunnel for a purpose, it's to bring out the bad air. So uh, I, I wanna thank the committee for putting up with uh, my emotional comments 
in the past, but I am emotional because this is this is our heritage in Seattle. Uh, we have nowhere else to go. Uh, and if the, the 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 great state of Washington loses their Chinatown, Japantown, little Saigon, uh, it's just not right. And that's what happens if you go down Fifth Avenue. You will lose the three neighborhoods. So uh, I, I, I don't know what more to say other than I've lived here all my life and, and uh, never have I had to put up a, such a difficult fight to stop something that's so wrong to our community. So, you know, uh, you just need to find a different answer and not go down fifth. So, I don't know. I'm sure I'll think of more things later, but for right now, uh, I don't blame uh, you, Lita, for any of this. You are the messenger. And, and I appreciate you doing all the things that you have done to, to try and help us get the message to Sound Transit that Fifth Avenue is not the right way. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, thank you for all of that. Um, uh, I think next on our list is um, Aaron. Thank you. In terms of the alternative that is chosen, I really want to defer to my CID and Pioneer Square neighbors to the north, but I do want to take a moment and, and speak to some of what Brian said, because he's absolutely right. This is a 10 year construction period. That is not a temporary condition. That is a permanent condition. And we need, while we're designing a route for a hundred years, we need to also think of what we want the area to look like in a hundred years. And I think he's absolutely correct. A Seattle without a vibrant, active international district in Chinatown is not, is not Seattle. And so I think it's really important that Sound Transit work with this community to find, to go with the selection, whether it's one of these or an alternate one to be determined that has the least impact to this historic and important community. Thank you, Erin. Um, Mary Kate. So I don't think anyone's addressed the deep options and HSD, Historic South Downtown did very briefly. We don't think the deep options meet the, the purpose and needs stated in the, the draft environmental impact statement. They don't promote a good rider experience for the next hundred years. They don't really address the, the connectivity needs. Um, and connectivity is a good segue into the preferred alternative that the Historic South Downtown Board chose was CID 1A, which is the Fourth Avenue shallow option. And connectivity is definitely at the top of the list of positive reasons to choose fourth. It has the potential to improve mobility and connectivity between the two neighborhoods that we serve, the Chinatown International District and Pioneer Square, and has the potential to activate that entire hub, the Jackson Hub area between King Street and Union Stations that our two communities have been working on for a number of years at this time. We, we see a lot of opportunities that could be capitalized on if the Fourth Avenue shallow alternative is, is the project that's chosen to be built. Additionally, we don't believe that with the information provided that the effects of the Fifth Avenue alternatives on the CID are mitigable at this time. Um, there's, there are too many, there's too much eating away at the edge of the district. Um, and, and that's just 
just from the physical standpoint. So we prefer the Fourth Avenue alternative beyond the connectivity. Uh, there's a the potential for increasing pedestrian safety and the reactivation of Union Station is a long stated goal for both of the communities that we work with. And that, we have a lot more to say. Um, we wrote a letter about it, it's on our website, but I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Mary Kate. Um, let's go to Jared. Thanks, Lydia. Well, uh, just echoing Mary Kate, um, uh, we, from Skipta's perspective, the deep uh, alternatives should not warrant any further study. We also believe they do not support long term visions. Um, um, nor do we think operationally that they, they work the best. So we do recommend that those be from further study. Um, as for the remaining shallow options, um, you know, in our comment letter, we did not identify a preferred alternative because we don't feel there's enough information about Fourth Avenue. Um, of the, the remaining options, Fourth Avenue is by far the least impactful to the CID. Um, it's businesses and residents and property owners uh, agreeing with Mary Kate and HSD that it does increase the uh, Fourth Avenue shallow does increase the potential for connectivity between the neighborhoods um, and in terms of supporting that long term uh, end condition for the station area. Um, you know, we, we do believe that Fourth Avenue is that is that alternative. Um, what I'd like to also mention is that, you know, the CID as a, as a neighborhood. Um, has been bisected and has been impacted by infrastructure projects every decade for the last six decades. And, and this next project is probably gonna be the next one, right? And so, um, uh, uh, a mitigation strategy identified going forward. Uh, we call that out in our comment letter as well. Um, that mitigation strategy needs to be centered on community, it needs to include residents, businesses, property owners, um, and other stakeholders within the neighborhood. Um, and it needs to take into account that past harm that's been done to this neighborhood. Um, is that the sole responsibility of Sound Transit? No, I don't think it is. Um, but between Sound Transit, King County, on this historic neighborhood and its, it's existential of crisis that it faces with this next infrastructure project. I think those things need to be taken into account. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. Appreciate the comments. John? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Um, and I appreciate and respect everyone's comments so far. And to Sound Transit, this draft EIS is large, both geographically and substantially um, in terms of the information uh, to go through, just for the CID part, let alone from West Seattle to Ballard. Um, we, we at the Public Stadium Authority don't think there's enough technical analysis to make a selection for a preferred alternative. Uh, we would like to see uh, additional analysis about what would the detours be for these various scenarios. Um, the draft EIS identifies which streets traffic might go to, but it doesn't look at cumulative effects. It doesn't look at um, what the detour routes uh, would necessarily be. It just identified roads. It didn't have any structure. Um, we, we at the stadium um, provide a number of high impact single event, um, single event occurrences. And, and so traffic on, on a traffic involving a full stadium is, is not analyzed anywhere in the draft EIS. But because of our volume, we also are not in favor of the deep alternatives because we don't believe that the elevators uh, could get, you know, when, when 69,000 people let out, can get enough people up and down to get them on the transit fast enough. Um, 
So besides traffic mitigation, both during construction and particularly uh, what would the traffic be like uh, if fourth was built? Because the reduction of a lane, what does that do? Um, we didn't find a, that analysis there either. Um, and having a detour plan for the scenarios are, are things that we'd like to see in order to make a decision. And then the other thing we'd like to see is the mitigation plan for the small business disruption in any of the scenarios, uh, or at least the surface scenarios. Um, if I was a small business, it'd be very hard to tell what's gonna happen to me or, or what Sound Transit's thinking in terms of uh, mitigating. And, um, you know, is, is it really gonna be nine years? Um, in, in some cases, yes. In some cases, it, it looks like road closures are six months. Um, so I guess there's a deeper mitigation and impact analysis to the small businesses that would also help make the decision. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, let's go to Tiernan. Thanks, Lita, and thanks uh, Sound Transit staff for leading the, the CAG all these months. Um, let's see, my comments, um, I don't have a, a preferred alternative for the Chinatown ID alignments, but um, I'll share some observations about the trade-offs of, of the uh, different alternatives. Um, most of these will, these comments will echo what you've heard before from folks like Mary-Kate and Jared. Um, so for the deep uh, options, both on 4th and 5th Avenue, I, I really don't think that, that those are serious <clears throat> options when you think about the 100-year life cycle of this infrastructure investment. And um, if, you, if you look 100 years into the future for our neighborhood, I certainly don't think that designing elevator-only access deep stations fits with the type of um, uh, connectivity and mobility that we would want to have. So I think um, those should be taken off the, the table. Um, and that leaves a, a couple of shallow options. Um, for those on Fifth Avenue, both the, the one that runs underneath Fifth and the diagonal option, I just feel that the um, amount of impact that you're talking about, um, both direct impact in terms of displacement of uh, businesses temporarily and, and permanently, and then the indirect impacts that uh, would occur from um, having con the construction of the station go on um, in the the core of the historic Chinatown portion of our district are just not something that we should we should support for the the uh, vitality of our neighborhood. Um, so I, I really don't think that that option fits with um, the, the the values that we hold here and that Sound Transit's been talking about, um, especially from a, a racial justice standpoint. So that leaves us with the Fourth Avenue shallow um, alternative, which I agree is sort of the least impactful in, in the negative sense of the word on the neighborhood. Um, that said, there are still some serious concerns that come up with that option, um, including the displacement of uh, the residents of an apartment building um, on the corner of Fourth and Jackson. Um, I don't think we should forget about those people in our analysis. I also think that the length of uh, the, the construction impacts for that alternative are concerning um, because 4th Avenue will need to be closed while the viaduct is removed. Um, and uh, where does the traffic go? So what, what I would really like to see Sound Transit do during the um, FEIS is come back to the community and provide us with a lot more information about that alternative. Um, I think we, we need to know some of the things that John just brought up. So what is the traffic management plan that the community can expect? Um, and what, you know, from the perspective of the community, I think that's the key, um, uh, not just sort of which streets will it go down, but, you know, um, really thinking, putting yourself in the shoes of small businesses and residents and visitors to the community so we can understand those impacts. Similarly, um, especially for the, the business owners, um, you know, what does the mitigation plan actually look like from their perspective? What resources will be available to them? How will Sound Transit work with the community 
to make those available, kind of filling in all the details there. Um, and then lastly, I want to say something about the station <clears throat> itself. We've talked about the potential to reactivate Union Station, um, which would be really wonderful with the Fourth Avenue shallow alternative tying in with the Jackson Hub. Uh, station area concept, which I think is a really, you know, when we talk about 100 years in the future, we, we need that space to be a space for people, not just for cars and for the trains that run beneath it. So I think that that's a really, um, you know, somewhat under uh, studied aspect of this alternative that I think would be a good use of time and re staff resources during the FEIS period or, or whatever window we have coming up here. Um, and I also really want us to look at some of the negative impacts that that station would have, like a very large ventilation station placed on the, the, the northwest corner of the Union Station Plaza. Um, and, you know, not just showing us where that is, but what are some alternatives um, that would be less impactful to the community so that that station is really a celebrated public space. Um, and and doesn't have you, you know sort of compromising features so those are some of the things i would really hope sound transit will look at um, in the next step of this process thanks again to staff for all your uh, support for the CAG. thank you Tarana. um jeremy would you like to share thoughts here i i would defer uh, any comments to the the CID people? So, okay. Jeremy, yeah, sure. Hi again, and thanks for this. Um, and looking at the fourth and fifth deep, they just don't seem like really good rider experiences. They rely on elevators that fail, long transition time, and that's not where anyone takes these modes of transportation. And so, I would take both of those out, looking at the fifth shallow and the fourth shallow. So the fifth shallow, that just seems really hard on the CID, the businesses, the residents, some of the historic buildings. And I don't see it offering any change for Pioneer Square to our existing light rail station. So that would leave me with the fourth avenue as the top choice for what's offered. While longer in construction, um, I think it will have the most use from Pioneer Square and for the CID. It, um, for people coming into Seattle, like using Amtrak and other modems, light rail, they will also have a connection there with it, which seems really good. It will reactivate Union Station, something we've been trying to do for a long time. It offers public realm upgrades and opportunities. But uh, in asking for the choice of alternatives, I think I also want to, I do, I also want to ask for more information in return. There's going to be high volume uses during events. I live in Pioneer Square, so in, in events, the CID, SOTO, how it affects us. I'd like to see more study, more analysis given for alternatives for a traffic management plan. So in asking for a choice, I could tell you, I guess, fourth shallow, but I also really would like a lot more information. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Jeff, for that. First of all, thank you to the Sound Transit staff for pulling these meetings together. This is a hefty topic with a lot of opinions and, and, a, and a lot of information. So thank you again for making it palatable for, for us. Um, I think for us, long-term Pioneer Square really prioritizes the pedestrian connection with this project. And you know, as look, when we were looking at the uh, DEIS, we understand that Fourth Avenue Viaduct rebuild viewed, viewed alone is a disadvantage. Um, however, we see we do see opportunity and potential there in reconnection of the neighborhoods, reconnection of the CID to the waterfront, um, better access to the ferry terminal, cruise terminal, the new waterfront transportation network. Um, we also support Union Station activation as a transportation hub with potential economic development potential for both neighborhoods. And as others have said, the deep options really on both fourth and fifth are pretty untenable um, from both the regional transit perspective and the neighborhood's perspective. Um, a new station with elevator access only will require queuing into the neighborhoods on a good day um, and will really dissuade folks, I think, from using the station on days with surge events. So for these reasons, we really do believe that Fourth Avenue Shallow provides the best outcomes um, with what we were presented. 
Um, having said that, we believe that there needs to be further study on any alternative or alternatives that move forward. Further study specifically around um, reducing construction timing and costs, haul routes, detours, surge event traffic routing, mitigation for businesses, property owners and neighborhood entities, um, King County Metro interruptions and temporary displacement, and then the temporary and long-term pedestrian conditions. So after we know more about these things, I think we'll have a better understanding of how to move forward with both Sound Transit and the city in mitigating the severe impacts this will have for both the CID and Pioneer Square. Thanks. Thank you, Jessa. Um, Yen, would you like to share your thoughts? And then George, thank you for joining. I just wanna let you know you'd be after Yen to share. Go ahead, Yen. Thank you. Um, I guess my question is more of not so much of a comment. The question is um, what was being built in CID is a regional transit hub. Is that correct? Right. And there's only how many regional transit hub is being built? One. This is the this is the big the big transit hub, but there are other transfer points. Um, so okay. what is a big transfer point that's important in the system as well? Yeah. So Thank you. So this is the only regional transit hub that's being built and it's being chosen to build in CID when other major metropolitan cities, regional transit hubs are in downtown or other locations. I appreciate the current CID station, but I think the question is, is why does CID have to take on the whole regional transit hub for sound transit? And right now, personally, as a resident in Little Saigon, I don't I have no preference for any of these as they are all impactful. Cahill just did a presentation last time about changing the route because of 300 new apartment buildings to mediate that apartment um, impacts. So there is possibility to also change the design for CID so that we're not having this. The impact here is really, really high. We're barely recovering from um, COVID. Um, there's still a lot of um, uh, boards on the windows. Uh, and you know the decisions that nonprofits have to make with income or funding that are coming in from the federal to invest that in windows instead of you know what other things that CID needs. So there's this neighborhood is slowly and trying to recover in this time of COVID, which I actually just got COVID a couple of weeks ago. So my energy is a little bit low, but I'm also feeling the impacts that this is having in my neighborhood. Right now, um, CID Coalition did request a 90 day extension on the public comments during the last week of when the public comments would do, there were so many businesses that were first time learning about what was happening in the neighborhood. So there's not enough people that are engaged in culturally language accessible, directly targeted um, to the residents. I used to live at Bush Hotel. How many of those residents would have known what is happening in the neighborhood and what their thoughts about what is happening in the neighborhood? So the request was for a 90 day extension because there are not direct targeted engagement to each of the businesses. Yes, you can host things at the various farmers market, but that's different than targeted cultural language communications. Um, so I wanna uplift CID Coalition's request for an extension on comments. I want to just share that I don't believe that CID should be taking on a regional transit hub for the whole region. Um, and I think that's it, thank you. Thank you, Yan. Um, George, are you ready to share? We're sharing thoughts on trade-offs between the draft EIS alternatives and the CIS um, and, and thoughts on a preferred. Yes, um, I agree with a lot of the comments that were already made about CIG. I think it's a better alternative is Fourth Avenue narrow. Um, how many, how many more hits can the CID take and what will be left of CID? I think it's gonna destroy that community in that neighborhood. And 
once it's gone, how can it come back? Um, I appreciate um, being able to be a part of this committee and engage in this process. And I appreciate all the time that everyone else has, has put into it, but I tend to agree with so many other, so many of the other reasons that were already mentioned. And I just, I just think it's unfair to the CID and I don't want to see it um, destroyed and disappear. Thank you. Thank you, George. Okay, I think we got around to everyone. I know that Becky had been hoping to come, but was going to be late and I don't see Becky yet. So with that, um, I guess we'll go ahead and continue on. I really just wanna say thank you so much to all the time that all of you have put into this for your feedback tonight. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and um, uh, hand it over actually to Cahill um, to share kind of next steps uh, and say thank you as well. Go ahead, Cahill. Thanks, Lita. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So I showed the slide at the start of the presentation. I, I just want to uh, re, re, remind folks again, uh, although this is our uh, last community advisory group meeting, there is a draft EIS workshop coming up again uh, later this month, as I mentioned. And then also uh, I remind people again about the, the board action in July. First, the system expansion committee would make a recommendation and then the board itself would confirm or modify the preferred alternative uh, later on in July. So. Uh, highlighting those upcoming milestones so people are aware of what's happening next in this process. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is just a slide that shows the dates of the community advisory group meetings, inclu including the one we've just had. Uh, I've kind of included it here because perhaps you're interested in, in checking out what the feedback was for other segments. Maybe, maybe that's not of interest to you, but if it is, um, all of these community advisory groups, as you know, are uh, live streamed, but also recorded. So you can go back in time and listen to that feedback as well. So just, just for a reminder, a reminder of that in case you are interested. Um, next slide, please. And then, as I mentioned, uh, the System Expansion Committee workshop coming up just next week, Friday, May 20th, uh, where the board, the Sound Transit Board, will start to contemplate the draft EIS. Um, we'll also be going to the System Expansion Committee in June to start to talk to them about what we're hearing in the draft EIS comments at that time. And then later on, in uh, that's not reflected on the sheet yet, we need to update it. But uh, also in July, then, uh, as noted, those are the specific dates for the System Expansion Committee. So the, the System Expansion Committee would meet on Thursday, July 14th, and then the Sound Transit Board would meet on Thursday, July 28th. Those are the dates right now that we would anticipate going to those um, to those forums to uh, get direction to confirm or modify the preferred alternative. So I wanted to make you aware of those upcoming dates. Uh, next slide. And then just steps again, you've seen this slide before, but at the moment we're processing the comments and we'll be sharing them with the Sound Transit Board so they can start to contemplate uh, all the feedback that's been received. Um, as I mentioned in July, the board would confirm or modify the preferred alternative. And then we need to develop a final EIS. There's still you know, a lot, lot of long way to go in this process and all the feedback that we receive uh, on the draft EIS, we'd be responding to that as part of the final EIS. And then it's after the final EIS is published, hopefully late next year, that the Sound Transit Board would select the project to be built. So it's really at that point in time that the, the project to be built gets, gets selected. So there's a bit of a ways to go yet in the process. Next slide. So that's really uh, it. Uh, kind of brings us to the end of today's meeting. And really, as we noted to the end of this series of community advisory group meetings for, for the CID solo segment, I, I just wanted to take a moment on behalf of the Sound Transit team uh, to thank you all for participating in this forum. Um, as you all know, this process started back in November over six months ago. And we appreciate all of the time that you've committed to seeing it all the way through in terms of reviewing all the materials. I know it's a lot, attending all the meetings, reaching out to your contacts and so on. I know there's a ton of coordination and conversation that has happened, particularly in this segment. And we hope these sessions have been helpful to you 
um, because we know they've definitely been helpful to us. And um, your input today and the input throughout the process has helped us as staff understand how this project could benefit the community that is going to serve, but also helped us better understand some of the concerns that you have. Um, and I know your feedback will be helpful to the board as it considers the path forward for the project. As I said, and as you know, this is the last community advisory group meeting, but if you have follow-up questions or thoughts, please do reach out to us. Um, this is the, you know, we're wrapping up the draft EIS phase of the project, of course, but we'll be continuing to engage community as we move forward on the project. This, this is just a step in the project development process, and there's obviously a very, a very long road ahead. So um, with that, again, just I want to just say thank you again for, for your commitment through this process. Um, do you regret that we haven't been able to get together in person as a group, only virtually? So really, I'm looking forward to the opportunities to connect with you in person in the future, hopefully. So great. And that. Cahill, I see a couple questions before we finally wrap up. Oh, um, okay. Sorry. First for you, Cahill, um, before we get to Tia, Mary Kate asked in the chat, are you able to describe what the May 20th workshop will be for the board? Oh yeah, sure. I should have gone into that. Um, so there'll be uh, an initial, uh, you know, welcome and introductions, a little bit of the context setting for, for, for the project. It is uh, one project in the overall ST3 plan, of course. So it'll be explaining the context of the project and, and some of the other things that have happened uh, more recently at, at a broader level, realignment, funding issues, things like that. Um, we'll do a project uh, overview. Um, for the benefit of folks. It's, it's information that this group has certainly seen before, explaining the timeline and the process um, and uh, the community engagement efforts and, and other activities like that, some of our passenger experience work and our racial equity toolkit work. And then the really bulk of the meeting is really meant to be looking at each segment of the project. So we have, as you know, four segments overall, Interbay Ballard, uh, Downtown, Soto CID, and then the West Seattle Duwami segment. So we'll go through each segment of the project and we'll be uh, explaining the different alternatives in each segment to the board, talking about what some of the benefits of the project are, uh, but also some of the key differentiators um, between the alternatives. And then we'll also spend a little bit of time uh, at the end of the meeting talking about some of the, the other uh, affordability issues and cost savings refinement ideas that we've talked about. So that's that's the, the agenda overall. Um, it's going to be an opportunity for the board members to start to contemplate. Um, and well, many board members have been contemplating for this for, for a long time and stuff like that. But as a board, starting to chat among themselves and discuss the project, there won't be any actions next week. This is not, you know, the actions don't occur until July. So this will be the start of them contemplating um, the project, the draft EIS. Um, uh, so, so it kind of essentially starting to prepare for that upcoming board action in July. Hope that was helpful. Great. Thanks, Cahill. And Tia, were you raising your hand? I'm good. It, my question okay. was about the board action and it was answered. So thank you so much. Great. Thank you both. All right. Well, I think we've had a chance to hear from everyone and I'm seeing that Lita just um, dropped into the chat more info on the workshop for anyone who's interested. Um, let's see. So I think that has covered our agenda for this evening. I know we've really enjoyed hearing from each of you um, and really appreciate everyone's time. So I wanted to echo what's been said and thank everyone for all the time participating in the community advisory group. We really appreciate your commitment to exploring how this project can best serve the community. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and adjourn our final CID Soto CAG meeting. Take care, everyone. Have a good rest of your evening. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks, you, everyone. Bye. Thank you all.